Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And I'm Devin Talks Board Game Co. Devin Talks Board Game Co. <laughs> yes, we are over here in uh, Devin Talks Tabletop Studios going through a whole bunch of end of the year lists. You can check those out. There's going to be a whole bunch over here, like right here watching this video. Right here. There's going to be a whole bunch over on Patreon as well. There's a bunch of overflow videos. Those might be more me, I think. But like mm. a bunch of these lists we're You're doing... You're just going to be talking. We're going to leave. Meg and I are going to leave. It's just going to be you talking. That's fair. The ones that are currently over on Patreon are actually just in my studio, not yours. Uh. As of now. But who's who's to say? All I know is who's sometimes, I, say? sometimes I, I find more games that I want to talk about. They're like, let's do best 10 games of 2022. And I'm like, actually, I don't want to talk about just 10. I want to talk about 20. Mm. So I've done that. So over on Patreon, you may find bonus videos. You, know, you will find bonus videos. Whether any of them are over here in the studio is a different conversation. But that's a little plug for the Patreon. Link down below. But past that... Today's video is the reason you clicked on this is for the juicy, spicy, top 10 disappointments of 2022. Looking at this it list. It sounds be, bad to say it. It does, but looking at this list, it's actually going to be fairly, this going to be a letdown of a list, honestly. It's going to be a letdown of a list? Yeah, the oh. list, the list is the number one disappointment <laughs> of 2022. Well, I, I can't speak for your list. I, my list in general. When I mean, you I, can if you want to. Well, I don't know your list. It's just going to be not informed at all. That's fair. Yes. My list in general, when I do these these types of negative lists, so to speak, top 10 disappointments of 2022, looking at these right now, mm. one, two, three, da, 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 only, it's hard to say, <laughs> one of these is a bad game in my opinion. The mm. rest of them are, are not bad games, but for me, a disappointment is not a bad game. Usually, in this hobby, the games that are actively bad, which are very rare, are games that I kind of almost expect them to be bad. To me, this is disappointments. These are the games I was hoping would be more. And in return, most of them were just solidly good games. Mm. I pissed off that one person with a solid. Right there. <laughs> but in general, this is true last year. Last year, I did a collaboration with uh, Jeremy Howard from Amazon Meeple over on their channel, Top 10 Disappointments. And it's the same idea. I had games like Merchant of the Dark Road in there, which I think is a great game. I just thought it'd be so much more. Yeah. And that's true for me. So if you're expecting a bunch of bad games, you came to the wrong place. If you're expecting a bunch of times I was disappointed, well, you're, you're here for the right place. Mm. What about you? What's your list like? My list is a mix of different things. It's games that I did actually feel disappointed by but sometimes it's not the game itself sometimes it's the perspective or expectation that i had going into yep. it and then that being undone and really riding on the hopes that i wanted my expectation to be met because that's why i was liking the game or yep. thinking i was going to like it and then i have other ones that i think are not actually wholly you know negative or like in, ter in terms of like dealing with the actual game but uh, like other aspects as to why I was like frustrated by some aspect of it. Sure. In terms, so it, it's but game. It's almost a game by game context as to why they're on the list. Now, are these all twenty twenty two titles? Um, eight of the ten are twenty twenty two titles in the sense that they have been released, and two of them are uh, crowdfunding centric, gotcha. and I have different reasons why each of them are there. Yeah. So for me, these are all twenty twenty two titles. My last list with Jeremy Howard. Some of them were they were all games I played in twenty twenty two. This time they're all twenty twenty two titles instead. Uh, we'll go through them. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start us off yeah, start with us one off. that is one I should have known better on, honestly, which is the Lord of the Rings, the card game. Ooh. Yes, the Ooh. Lord of the Rings, the card game. Like the LCG? The LCG. Okay. Fantasy Flight, we released the LCG, and I have been getting, not getting, I am very into Marvel United. I really, not Marvel United, Marvel, I mean Marvel United 2, <laughs> but Marvel <laughs> Champions. I've been very into Mar Marvel United. Is not Say Marvel and then finish it with another noun, and Alex is interested in it. <laughs> Marvel Remix, solid game, enjoying it. Solidly good. Do you uh, like it more than Red Rising? Yes, very oh, much so. Okay. Very much so. I like Marvel Remix. Let's take a second talk about Marvel Remix. <laughs> Marvel Remix, have you played Marvel Remix? I have not. Marvel not. Remix, I, I haven't played Fantasy Realms, but Marvel Remix takes the core gameplay and distills it into such a simple little thing that it's exactly what it is. Mm. I think Red Rising tried to make more of it, and I like what Marvel Remix is doing, and I'm a sucker for Marvel, and I think that being less is, in this case, more. Have you tried Marvel Snap? Yes. What do you think? I enjoy it for casual fun. It's, mm. it's a different different genre. I'm me. just adding, you know, different nouns Absolutely. after Marvel and just. No, Marvel you know. Snap is solid as well. The problem with Marvel Snap is that ultimately, like, what particular playground you're fighting in is kind of random to the point that there is good deck building in play, but also there's a lot of luck in it. I enjoy it. It's good for casual distraction. Are you looking forward to Marvel Harbingers? Never heard of it. Oh, I just added a noun after. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your what's your first? My first one, Lord of the Rings is a card game. So being into Marvel United, Marvel 
Champions, holy <laughs> hell, Marvel Champions has really made me want to try Marvel uh, Lord of the Rings the card game again, mm -hmm. which I played way back in the day when I first got into the hobby. I tried it. I was like, let's try this out. Didn't love it back then. I don't remember a lot about it. It was a long time ago. I played Android, the LCG, like that. But I was like, you know what? We're going to try Lord of the Rings. I love the IP. We're going to try it again. We're going to dive back into the re-release that nothing gets me my attention just like re-releasing some game that I didn't like the first time. Mm -hmm. Re-release it with like whatever, no changes, and I'm all there for you. Um, and so I dove into it, and it was like, I we watched a Rodney Smith watch or play video from like back in the day. <laughs> good went old into that. Rodney. Good old Rodney. Uh, and then played it, and it was like, this is good. I don't mind it. But, like, for some reason, I was expecting more from it, I guess. And I don't think it's as much that they re-released it. There wasn't really a lot of changes to it. For me, I think I kind of had this mental image in my head that I didn't appreciate it enough because I was new to the hobby and that I'd, I would play it and I would love it. I just mm. thought that because it's held up. It's one of the one of the LCGs. From all the LCGs Fantasy Light has done, that is their longest standing one. Yeah. The other ones they've done in that age and frame have gone away. They had Warhammer. They had Star Wars. They had Android Netrunner. They've all gone away. Warhammer and Netrunner. Oh, yeah. Man. You played the Warhammer one? I never played the Warhammer yeah. one. Warhammer is one that, like, you could slap Warhammer on anything and I'm interested. Yeah, it's I, it's, I it's, it's it. my marble for you. I, I liked um, it. I liked and then it. Netrunner, I think, is an amazing game. But they've all, just, yeah. they've all gone away. And so I was like, between liking the IP, between liking the, the LCG format, and between the fact that it's long-lasting, I just assumed I would like it more. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of exactly what I remembered it to be, which was a good game, but did not yeah. hook me, felt more procedural, did not get heavily invested in the coolness of what I was doing. It feels a bit like a slog to me. Mm. People like it a lot, but like I like I like Arkham Horror the card game a lot, mm -hmm. and I don't think it was a maturity in gaming thing. I think just Lord of the Rings the card game, just not for me. Just not for you. And it's a good game, by the way. I still actually rated it pretty decently. <laughs> it's uh, pretty decent. I, I may have given it a, even a four. I think it's really good. Yeah. Just compared to War, uh, Marvel or Arkham Horror the card game, those two I think are just such better evolvements of the genre. Mm. Evolutions of the genre. There evolvements is not the right evolvements, word. Evolvements, I think, is a word. It could be a Are word. Are you looking forward to Marvel Evolvements? <laughs> Marvel Evolvements is so <laughs> cool. Oh my gosh. The way... Wait, that's not really... They didn't announce that yet. Yeah, I broke my up. NDA. We'll my, <laughs> my first one is Libertalia Winds of Gale Crest. By the way, if someone over at Command Headquarters is like, crap, how do they know Marvel Evolvements? <laughs> <laughs> that would be so good. <laughs> my my first one is the re uh, introduction of Libertalia Libertalia Winds of Galecrest by Stonemire Games. Had you played the original? I have not played the original. It was one that I was always interested in, and there are people that I am friends with in the industry. They're like, man, Libertalia high player counts is such like just this manic fun time. And I played it, and in the initial two or three times I played it, I played it at two and three players, which I actually think are decent player counts for I it. I preferred it lower um, counts. And w which was funny because I was like, the reason why I was excited to try it out was I was like, oh, like a strategic card game that could play at higher player counts. And then I liked the the two player with the midshipman tile where you could go to the left or the right of it. I liked the three player element. And I was like, okay, I was like, I enjoy this. And then I was really ramping up. I was like, okay, I was like, I finally locked it in. I got like, I can't remember if it was a full, f I think it, it may have been a full six player game, but I know it was at least five. And so I was like, got a high player count game. And I was like, ready for the stuff that everybody's been talking about. And I, I was Pure like... Pure chaos? It, 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 was, it was not... It was too much chaos and just not enough... I, I felt like I had no control over what was happening. Because when you have those higher player counts, you have so many people that have the exact same cards that the ability to actually really get something that no one else has is so low and then it really just comes down to like where your uh your ranking is yeah. to where we, if yours is going to be the leftmost or not and that is an improvement over the original the original mm -hmm. is completely random this one at least they have a tiered system of how it moves along yeah but the general idea of the game for those who don't know it's it's you're playing these cards that have abilities in them to a ship and you start off with the same cards and as you play things your hands will change but you start off with the same cards you get the same cards round to round and so a lot of it comes down to trying to predict what your opponents are doing you're like if i have this hand of cards and you have this hand of cards how are we going to try to mentally screw with each other yeah which to me works great at three and four players is. I don't know if I, which one I prefer. I, I do like a little more chaos, but not too much. At five and six, I find that it's too much. It just becomes a guessing game, which almost turns it into a party game, which yeah. might be what you're looking for. But it's long for that. It's long for yeah. that. And so my I, that's another game. It's a good example of a game that I actually really like that game. But my biggest critique was at five and six, it feels partyish, but not party enough. And yeah. at three and four is where I like it. But there's so many other games I like more. Yeah. But I actually really yeah. like that game. It just. I'm not going to pull it, it Yeah, it, it fell into this weird place for me where I was like, 
I'm not going to play it at the player counts that I want to play it at, or, or that I prefer to play it at, and the player counts I want to play it at, it turns into like, you know, it was like a 90 minute, like, well, I mean, for the people that I was playing with, it ended up being closer to two hours. And it was like, the, for, for what it is, it's, it's like, that's long. just too long. And so I love the production of it. I love like the new art design. I was also very excited about playing it because Paolo Mori did Blitzkrieg and Caesar, which I have had a fantastic time with. I really like those. And I was like, oh, it's like, I want to see what else he's designed and worked on. And I just, I wasn't a fan. Now for my number nine, before we dive into mm -hmm. it, did you order your list at all? Um, I, I put numbers next to them. I didn't <laughs> rank them in terms of how I felt about them. So I did rank mine in terms of least disappointed to most disappointed. Oh, okay. oh. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to. I didn't. Yes. Just so you know, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so my number nine is, uh, Trud Vang Legends from Come On. Speaking of Come On. The, okay, yeah. And, and isn't this a new iteration of it? Nope. No, it's Trud Vang Legends no. is, uh, that might, you might be thinking of Project Elite. I don't know. Yeah, I, that's what I was Definitely, thinking of. Definitely, totally. Project Elite. The way that I was thinking about it makes me seem more informed. Which I yes. ranked specifically in order. <laughs> number seven. It was exactly where I wanted it to be. Project Elite, yes. Uh, yeah, Trepang Legends is Kaman's, one of the Kaman's newest arrivals. They actually split into two phases. They have a core box that was delivered, and I don't know what's going to happen with all the stretch goals. They're going to show up at some point, but like mm. they have a whole... I have a whole lot of content. I need to sell that off to somebody. But I, I walked into Trepang Legends expecting what it was but better mm. it's basically an exploration narrative game it's a game which you're going to have your your little miniatures you're going to wander around the map you're going to have bag building as you build a bag and engage with various enemies and it has a story as you go through different locations it will unlock different encounters so you if, uh, encounter with this you engage in story text you go down to choose your own adventure do you chase the troll do you you know try to talk to the troll it has all those encounters how and long ago was this campaign how the, the, the game like two and a half three years ago it showed up. It's late. It's overdue. They made some major changes to it. They're like, we don't like the way this is going. We're making some major changes to the game. Like, I know I'm cutting you short, but it almost just feels like where it was when it was designed and where it, it is now cooler. that it's fulfilled is like in a much more crowded space it is of exactly like really, really space. good ones. In fact, I the reason I got rid of it is because there were direct comparisons I would rather play. Yeah. For me, Treadmine Legends, I've been waiting for two and a half years for it. There are some cool elements. There's a board that has sleeves in the board. So the sections, like the cities have sleeves. So mm. you can slot in changes to the game. The world remembers itself literally because you slot in these cards. So the city you are at is now burning on fire and you close the board, put it away. There's a card in the board. There are some cool concepts there. And that's all they are. They're just like minorly cool concepts. Mm. For me, the actual direct comparison, which is actually funny, I know that, not funny, it just makes sense. Um, Board Game Ramblings, I know, had the exact same comparison, where for me, it felt like I could play Trudvang Legends or I could play Role Player Adventures. Direct comparison. Both of them had very good choose your own adventure storytelling, although I thought Role Player Adventures was much better. Both of them had lighter mechanical concepts as far as the combat goes. Except I thought World Play Adventures was a little better and a little more different as you went through it. And both of them were basically minor fighting, large storytelling, exploration games with like choose your own adventure and all those things. I liked Treadman Legends. I did. I thought it was pretty solid. But there was no circumstance in which I would pick that over World Play Adventures. Yeah. Unless and until I ran out of World Play Adventures. Possibly went through Destinies. Like there's a bunch of games in that. There's game. other ones that you would just yeah. play. Yeah. And for me, the biggest problem was that the 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 token bag building combat they had just didn't level up fast enough compared to, like, you got to a point where you're like, the same monster, can we just go through this process? Okay, I'm going to pull these cards, I'm going to sign these tokens. Okay, wait, it's the same monster again. Let's do the same cards. The monsters didn't evolve fast enough, and the uh, cards didn't evolve fast enough that I was like, you know what? Maybe this is a game where all the expansion content fixes it, but I'm not going to wait around that long. If it actually yeah. for an expansion... To me, expansions have to build on enough of an interest yeah. that it's fine. They can't... It's not, they're yeah. not supposed to fix it. Yeah. And and maybe uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. All I know is I have plenty of games in the genre. And so, Trudvang Legends, solid game. Disappointed. Mm. Number two for me is Soul Forge Fusion. Number, which... Why do you do it that way? Number nine for Thank me you. is Soul Forge Fusion. <laughs> It's a countdown. All the lists count down. So I know it's a countdown, but when I'm building a list, I like a numbered mentally. list starts with one. <laughs> Unless you're a board game content creator, then your list have to have ten games. Yeah. You have to count down, and but, you have to play all the new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Also, you're supposed to like number edit in pictures of the games too, but we don't do that either. What is a picture? I'll just have AI do it. <laughs> 
So, um, Soul Forge Fusion is to be my clear, number nine. That's taking away my job. I don't care about that. <laughs> number nine is is Soul Forge Fusion for me, and I would say that this is a unique circumstance in which I'm actually not upset about the game itself. By the and by game, I mean the game design. What I am playing, I am content with. I'm happy with it. I think that everything else about the production of this game and the presentation of this game does a direct disservice to the design. And it is so substantial that it makes me not want to play a game that otherwise I would be very happy to play. I'm on that cusp. Um, like the the fold out and, and and this is not trying to be like 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 this is genuine this is not from a place of like criticism in which I'm trying to blast. It's more of like I am like frustrated that I'm that this game is not as accessible to me and to other people as it could be. Um, the, currently, like the production copy of it to me feels like a prototype. Yeah, and I would actually even say less than many of the prototypes that I receive or that you that they you know, have I, tokens. Like prototypes, at least give you some sort of very often, not always, give you like an yeah. actual token. This feels whatever. Yes, go ahead. Keep yeah, it, it it feels like a prototype from the industry where the industry was like ten years ago. And it's being pushed as a final production now. It's just like, you know, the, the paper mat doesn't even have the complete graphics art on it. You need, like, the actual neoprene mat to get that. Um, like, the rule book exists only online and not physically in the game itself. Um, it, it, it is like, there are elements to the production of that that are inexplicable to me. Like, I, I do not understand if you told the decision me, process. If you told me that somebody accidentally okayed the production of 50,000 of the prototype instead of the final production, I'd be like, oh, that makes sense. Yes. That's, that makes sense. That's how it happened. Yes. And then they're like, oh, well, now we're too late. We've got 50,000 copies of it. That would make sense to me. It, 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 it's baffling. Yes. And, and, and from, like, you know, yeah, I... I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. And it's a great game. We've talked about this before. We both love the game. We're I love two-player card games. I love lane systems. Like, I love deep decks and combinations and hybrids. Like, everything design-wise around it is something that should cater to me and my preferences. And I'm, like, I'm almost, I'm, like, offended to put that on the table. Like, in terms of what I expect. My number eight. Maybe I should have put that down <laughs> if we're ranking things. My number eight is another big box adventure game, very big box adventure game that, again, good, but also I wanted more from it. Mm. Can you guess what this one is? Big box adventure game that you wanted big box more dungeon from. Crawler. Big box dungeon crawler. Darkest Dungeon? No, haven't got them far enough into that to call it a um, yet. <laughs> no, no, it sounded worse. Wow, that sounded way worse. I meant, I have played. I have played the tutorial scenario of Darkest Dungeon. I have not played enough to call it a disappointment or to like it or not like it. I was intrigued with what I saw, but I need to actually play the game. I don't judge a game by the single tutorial mm. scenario. Man, a dungeon... Cr I, I don't... I Bard Sung. Oh! Bard Sung for Steve Wars games is definitely a disappointment for me. That's one that... I, I played... Back, back when the prototype came out, when they had the Kickstarter, I played a boss encounter there. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, and I said this at the time in the video, I, was, I played the boss encounter and I was like, I don't know how much decision space there is in the combat itself of the one scenario I played, yeah. I like, but I'm really looking forward to the leveling. I was like, the leveling and building of your hero, I think that's where the game is. And from being another 10, 15 hours into it at this point, I think I absolutely believe that's where the game is, at least for me. I don't find the encounter. It's a, it's a giant dungeon crawler. You have your characters. You have your team. You can play it solo. You can play it with multiple players, whatever. You're just controlling a character. You build your characters. You slowly level them up. You put stats. You put uh, experience points into the actual stat building, as well as into the various spells and different things you'll be unlocking, away, unlocking along the way. There's also gear and all those things, and that's all great, and that sounds great, except the problem is you generally have to go through a gameplay loop of, like, three or four adventures before mm. you get any leveling up. And in those three or four adventures, I don't feel like I'm making enough decisions yeah. in the combat. And so ultimately, similar to Trudvang Legends, I find that... And then the reason Trudvang Legends is higher for me is at least I got more story out of Trudvang Legends, more mm. choose your own adventure. Yeah. But for me, this one, Bardsung, was... It gave me enjoyable combat for the first few minutes until you find yourself in that tedious, this is what I do, this is the spell I play, these are the people that do this, didn't feel that nuanced in what I was doing, and the leveling up was too infrequent for me to enjoy the part that I enjoyed, which yeah. I enjoyed it. So overall to me, Bardsung was one that I, I gave it 10-15 hours and I got to a point where I was like, I either have to house rule this, 
to make the leveling up and character building better and faster for me, or I have to move on. And I, I usually make the decision to move on. Infrequently, I'll make the decision to house rule something. Usually, I just move on. I'm like, yeah. I just don't want to sit there and try to figure out how to make this the best game for me. Yeah. It's just time to call it a day. And so, Bardson, good game, solid, a little too much grind relative to the uh, character building. That's fair. Number eight for me is... Good job with the eight. Uh, thanks. I'm mentally working You're mentally on mentally working. <laughs> I'm like... He can't count it. He's like, my number eight. eight, eight. Seven, six, five, four... Um, eight for me is Townsfolk Tussle. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I, I think part of it for me is the difficulty of two different things. Number one, the hype train that existed around Townsfolk Tussle, like the furor of people who were like getting their copy, playing with it. And I will say like for a first time production from like Panic Roll, they did amazing. Yes, like they did. I, they're, they're a small team. Like they created something that was beautiful um, it's absolutely gorgeous to unbox, and I know that, like, it really does have an incredible amount of, like, world building within the, yep. like, town's folk that you're tussling with. Um, Lots of character. Possibly, yeah. the, some of, possibly the most character I've seen in the game. Yeah, it's it's genuinely fantastic in terms of, of, of all of those aspects. And then, at the same time, though, Vagrant Song came out. Oh, I prefer Townsfolk Tussle. You do? I do. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not even on that hype train. I To me, Townsfolk Tussle is very good. Yeah. I have complaints about it, but ultimately it's an experience I thoroughly enjoy and I yeah. have a lot of fun with. But Vagrant Song, I mean, Vagrant Song has gotten a lot of hype as well. Yeah. So, like, I'm not, I'm not surprised at your comparison or your choice. And and it's possible that, for me, it's Both that I've had time. Vagrant Song. And, and I'm not opposed to changing my mind on Townsfolk Tussle and getting it back at a later point. Um, but for Vagrant Song... I've played both it and Townsfolk Tussle at four, and it really like both of them really dragged at four in terms of the overall experience. But I've played Vagrant Song at two, and I much preferred the pace of that. And also, I found that the fact that in Townsfolk Tussle you have a static enemy board, and then you just shift the terrain around. But also, the terrain is always going to be the same no matter the opponent. It's yeah. just when you face the opponent is going to determine how strong they are. And in Vagrant Song, I felt that the terrain was the same in terms of the train, but how each enemy used the terrain was way more like it changed the whole game rather than changed a few like considerations. Yeah. Um, the, the boss battles that I had were wildly different in Vagrant Song versus in Tom's Folk Tussle, I felt like it was more... Really? And again, I, I, you know, I, mean, I, I haven't played as much as, as you have, I think, in both of them. But, like, I, I, I just... Something about Vagrant Song spoke to me more. And, and I think I... Maybe it was the fact that I felt like there was a big... It was a larger narrative thread. There is. And, and really, in Towns of Tussle, it's more just... Boss fight, boss fight, It's more boss fight, boss fight, boss fight. Yeah, that's what I hear completely. And that kind of, like, wears on me a little bit. And I really did like... Vagrant song a lot. For me, I think both are fantastic. Both have a ton of character. Lots of pros and cons about both. Well, lots of pros about both. A few cons about both. Yeah. I, I'm just I am surprised by that boss one primarily because one of the strengths to me of Townsfolk Tussle was how each boss really I felt they brought their own character to the game. Yeah. Um, although Vagrant Song is fantastic as well. It's not the Vagrant Song that lacks that. Vagrant Song is tremendous and. The way you have like these billowing bots, it's, it's, yeah. it's so good. It's so good. I, I probably the thing that I didn't mention about townsfolk that was one of the like slow points for me was I do feel that early on, like the fight was very 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 tough when you don't have anything leveled up like in yeah. those early two stages, and then I felt like it was like uh, too easy. It, it it made it easier by the end. And that like in that's like the opposite grind that I want. I don't want. Um, I either want sustained difficulty throughout, a la Bloodborne or something like that, where like I feel like you have to continually learn, even though you're getting better at the game. Um, but having like this like super uphill fight that mellows out, like as you get so much stuff that you're able to kind of like overwhelm even the higher escalations of an enemy. That 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 just like pace felt weird to me. Yeah, I hear that. So, my number seven, if I can remember it over here, or just look it up. My number seven is another big box dungeon crawler. Although mm -hmm. I'm not gonna have you guess one, not quite as big. Uh, actually, based on a video game. How about I do that? Ooh. Based on a video game. Dungeon crawler. Yes. Based on a video game. Yes. Resident Evil. Wolfenstein the board game. Oh. I actually really like Resident Evil. <laughs> Wolfenstein the board game. Wolfenstein the board game from RPG Studios. Chaos Incarnate. 
is one that I, again, totally fine game. You're going to hear that me say that every single time. Totally fine totally game. Totally fine game. Solidly good. Solidly good. <laughs> Wolfenstein the board game just didn't feel innovative to me in anything that it did. Mm. I felt like the only thing that was really interesting there was they slapped the IP on there and then had a totally fine dungeon crawler that didn't, nothing about it stood out to me. They did have one thing that was good and different, but it wasn't enough for me to be like, mm. that's why I need this game. That one thing was they had an ammo system in terms of the way you can expend ammo, get extra ammo, use that ammo for special abilities on your weapons. It didn't feel that different. And the rest of it felt like you just had your missions and you just wandered down the hallways and you attacked enemies and you shot your, like it did nothing about it. Do you wonder if it stems from coming from a primarily miniatures based company shifting into doing games? I don't games? yet know. Yeah. Arkham Studios in general, I know they've done a lot of games that started with miniatures to a degree and they started doing games. Yeah. I don't yet have a feel or a sense of how good an Arkham game is yet. I yeah. just don't know. Yeah. What I do know is... I was hoping for more from Wolfenstein. Part of it is because I know King of Ravage had a chance to play it and he really liked it. And I do find my tastes overlap with his a decent amount, not a ton. And I was like, ooh, that's a good testimonial, you know, because like, you know, if he, he liked the game, awesome, excited for it. And it's my genre of game. And then I played it and I was like, it's okay. It's not bad. It's just nothing. When I sit there and I pull out any game, I want to know why am I playing this game? What is this yeah. game doing that compels me? There's nothing wrong about Wolfenstein. Nothing wrong. And what I would say is sometimes the nature of playing so many games is that someone else's first game in the genre might be Wolfenstein. They'd be like, I love it. It's so good. And then they play four other games in the genre and they're like, those ones don't impress them versus me, the other games may have come first. Yeah. That is an interesting aspect of being a content creator or just playing a lot of games in general. With a game that has such a recognizable IP, I always, in my mind, I'm always wondering, does it feel like the IP? So like Bloodborne for me, the board game, does feel like yeah. Bloodborne, the video game. And you have said specifically that Assassin's Creed oh, feels really like Assassin's feels like Assassin's Creed. Creed. Does what, does Wolfenstein even feel like Wolfenstein? Or I is mean, it kind of just like, it is Wolfenstein, but it's you're, you're playing You're walking better. around and you're shooting baddies. Does that feel like Wolfenstein? But I guess like more of like the... I think a first-person shooter is hard to capture. Unless yeah. your name is Six Siege, in which case, congratulations, you're awesome. Golly, I can't wait for that game to come. But Wolfenstein, I think it. I don't know if it necessarily captured the feel of Wolfenstein. I wouldn't say it was not in the feel of Wolfenstein. Mm -hmm. It was again. It just. It was a perfectly good check mark across the board, and nothing that compelled me. And I was hoping for more from it. Nice. Yeah, I, I. I was really. That was actually before. Maybe before I met you, or pretty early after we knew each other. That was one that I actually like oh, reached out to this. Archon, and I was like. I really like Wolfenstein. Can I please take this out? And they were like, who are you? <laughs> and I was like, great question. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that. Um, seven for me is So You've Been Eaten. Oh. Which. Is that a 2022 title? It is. Why is that not on my list? Of disappointments? Uh, maybe I just. <laughs> maybe I or think. just on your list on, of 2022 on, stuff. On disappointments. I didn't yeah. love that one. So. I I think part of it for me is I was drawn in by two factors. And number one is Quancha Mirai is one of my favorite artists. Yep. He's one of the best in the industry. Anything he does, I want to check out. And then I liked the gimmick of a game that could be like a two-player game, a solo game, and a zero-person game where you could just have the game play itself. I think that's hilarious, and I love like the humor of that. I love the design quirk of that. And I, I was just, I'm pretty early in like the time in which I've spent doing solo games, but I felt like I've played some phenomenal ones. I've played Space Hulk Death Angel, which I really enjoy. I played Final Girl, you know, uh, Rolling Realms, Mini Golf. Like I've played a lot of solo experiences, which I've had a really good time with. And so I was like, oh, I was like, this could be a cool solo game. And then I played it and I was like, this is f fine. I was like, this is fine. It's fine. And the artwork... What you like? It wasn't enough to save how how like middling I felt about the game experience, and also, despite like maybe the marketing quirk of the zero versus zero, I'm literally never going to choose to sit down to have a game play itself. The zero versus zero is a great quirk when you already like the game. Yes, it's yes. not enough to own a game if you don't care for it. Yes, and so so even it was just kind of one that like I was like, this seems really intriguing. And then I, I walked away from it going, 
On to the next one. That's and, what I was you know, So I, Maybe it wasn't on my list because I, I believe I played it when they had the prototype originally, so I may mm-hmm. not have thought of it in that case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I played both modes. I played a two-player. I played each solo mode. I did not bother playing the Zero vs. Yeah, Zero. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's going to change my mind. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was fine. There were aspects of it that were fun. There were a little bit of leveling up on both sides. just pulling in the time to get the right cards. But like nothing about it caught my attention. It yes. just felt fine. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. My number six is the second command title on this list. And this is one where initially, well, I'll explain. I'll explain. 2022. You're not going to think of it. Seamon I'll title. save you some time. You're wait, not going to think of it. Wait. I'll give you 17 guesses and you're not going to get it. Is it? You're not going to get it. The Rivet Wars. Nope. That's not out yet. Keep and also going. Steve Keep Forge going. took over that. Keep um, going. You're not going to get it. When I say it, you're going to be like, oh yeah, it's never going to get that. It's going to be really satisfying if you do get it, so you keep guessing. Massive Darkness. No, next. Um, let's skip to the part where you're right. Okay, cool. Zombicide. Gear, Gear up. up. Oh, I actually was wondering about that when I was making my list. I was like, I should ask Alex if this is on his list. It's on my list. I could have maybe gotten there. Maybe. If I, <laughs> in fact, even knew it existed, it does help. Yeah. Zombicide Gear Up is the Zombicide, ro- Zombicide <laughs> Roll and Write game. It, it's... And, and initially, you might be like, why would you expect that to be good? How is it a disappointment? Again, my criteria is I wanted to expect the game to be good in some way. Yeah. And you're instinctively, I wouldn't expect Zombicide Gear Up to be good. Nothing against it. Just I, I find whenever you adapt a game to another version of the game, you're starting at a disadvantage. Because in general, most games aren't good. Mo- some games stand out above the... That's not true. Most games are good. Most games don't stand out. Yeah. And some games stand out, but when you try to... whenever you, This is true for sequels and movies or TV, whatever it is. When you, whenever you're trying to take off on something that already did well and still hoping that the next thing does well, if it's the same formula, like it's more zombicide, it's one thing, but to change it up is always... like That's why most derivatives, most X the card game, X the dice game, X roll and write, they're almost always not as good as the original. Except in the case of, like, you know, let's say Fleet the dice game is amazing. But, like, there's, like, there's exceptions, but more often than not, they are not as good. In the case of Zombicide Gear Up, the thing that gave me hope is, do you know what the designer is? No. The designer is the designer of cartographers. No. So now we have a roll and write that's in the Zombicide IP from the designer of one of the better roll and writes out there. And I was like, now I'm interested. Hmm. Are you telling me that Zombicide Gear Up is kind of like Marvel Eternals or Thor Love and Thunder where you're like, it's more in the same world, but it's just not good. Yeah. It's okay. It's It's not bad. And, and to be fair, I it's wonder... It's solidly good. It's, it's, honestly, it's one of the more... <laughs> You're like... No, it, 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 it is fine. It's, just, it's fine. Everything's competing in different genres is what yeah. they're doing. It's fine. My problem with it is a, it's, a, it's a cooperative role and write. And I played it a few times, had fun playing it a few times, and then moved on with my life and never felt the need to play it again. Mm. It, it, I think part of the problem is role and writes sometimes feel a little looser in how competitive they are in and of themselves. The thing that I like about them is that they feel competitive when I'm playing against somebody else. Yeah. So Cartographers on its own isn't actually that competitive. You're mm. just trying to get as many points as possible. Mm. Playing against somebody else is like, I'm trying to beat your score. The binary nature of the win-lose aspect, I just didn't... I haven't found a cooperative roll and write that I like yet. Competitive, yes. Solo, That's yes. Fair. Cooperative roll and writes, I haven't found any that I like. And I played it both solo and cooperative. And it was good... Did not stand out in any way. Hmm. You, you unlock these weapons for your characters, which give you better polyamina pieces you place on the enemies. You try to get them down. The bosses were challenging. I appreciated that. The rest of the game to get to the bosses felt tedious, and even the bosses didn't feel like there was enough there. Hmm. It was okay. Nice. Yeah. Or not. No. Okay. <laughs> My number six is Tales from the Loop, the board game. Ooh. So... Don't know anything about it, honestly. Yeah, so this is a board game implementation of the Tales from the Loop world or art which comes from uh simon i'm gonna uh, stellenhog i'm gonna butcher that uh but anyways it's associated with so this is from free league publishing whose first board game title was crusader kings and then this is their second board game that they brought out and if you know free league or you, you know me talking about free league they're like my favorite rpg publishing company out there and my issue with this game is that I have played previous to this, the RPG, and playing the board game felt like I was thrust into the world of the RPG and I wasn't allowed any of the freedoms of it. I was constrained in a world in which I wanted to kind of like enjoy the, you know, creativeness and the the exploration that I find in the RPG, but because of the mechanics of the game, I was like... 
it was distilled into a rather confining experience. Okay. And I don't know how to get around that. I think if people maybe go to the board game first and then maybe go to the RPG after, they would have possibly the complete opposite feeling that I did. And, like, I, I don't really have... Like, there are some ways in which I felt like some of the mechanics weren't as strong as others. You know, the, 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 the idea of playing and, and like, have... Part of the difficulty of, of Tales of the Loop in general, and it's not really, it doesn't really have to do with just a board game or the RPG, it has to do, do with the universe, is it's kind of like Stranger Things in Sweden in an alternate 80s where like wormholes and a bunch of science and robot stuff happens. Seems reasonable. But it means that by nature you are forced to play as kids in the like you're playing as like teenagers and young and you preteens and stuff which in the RPGs feels a lot more f- like like I don't mind that restriction because you're able to role play a lot and you can kind of like bend and create your own elements to that but in the board game like you have like expectations you need to be home in time to go to bed at night and like the limitations of being a kid thematically and then also by nature mechanically felt worse in a board game in a way that it didn't feel bad when I was playing the RPG. So just like the the iteration that they came up with in the board game kind of reminded me of what the weaknesses could be if you were forced to stay within those weaknesses and you couldn't move around them. Cool. Yeah. Sounds reasonable. So number five? My number five is going to be 3,000 Scoundrels. Have you even heard of this one? I have. I the art on this is so appealing. It is. Every time I see people talk about this, I'm like, this looks like a game that looks so cool. The concept too. Do you know the concept? You know why it's called Three Thousand Scoundrels? No. Because you have cards that are these scoundrels, mm. and you have overlay sleeves that have modifying abilities. And so when you combine them, is it the number of combinations? And, well, it's not exactly three thousand because of the math, but it's somewhere like three thousand seventy-two or something like mm. that. It's three thousand seventy-two possible combinations, and they. The idea being that you have the cost defined by both of them, mm-hmm. but you have the way the card activates defined by one, and what the card does defined by the other. So let's say you've just had two cards. You might have, when you play an ace, you know, take $2. Mm-hmm. But you also might have a different two cards that say, when you pass first, you, you know, take back a bluff token, or whatever it is. And so the combination of those already creates four different cards. Because mm-hmm. now you have when you pass first, take a bluff token. When you pass first, take $2. Or when you have when you play an ace, take a bluff token. When you play an ace, uh, take $2. Mm-hmm. And you have this with a ton of different cards and a ton of combinations. And so you're always playing with different characters and different cards and different abilities. And it's so incredibly cool. It's just a, a problem that the rest of the game around it isn't that interesting to me. Mm-hmm. leans heavily into a kind of a bluffing mechanic that doesn't feel like I'm that compelled to play. And then just as badly... The process of sleeving and unsleeving as you go throughout the game just creates an extra degree of... I think the concept is cool, and I want to see the concept done in other games. In this particular game, it felt like too much work for not enough payoff. That's I disappointing. Could, I could just have 300 different cards. Just give yeah. me 300 different cards, and I would have been fine. I didn't need 3,000. 300 different cards. I think it, I think that's my problem. I think the what the cards are doing isn't interesting enough that the pairing of different variabilities to give me 3,000 combinations... It feels like I could have just played with... Also, you don't see that many cards per game either. You see, like, maybe 50 cards per game. Mm. You could have given me 300 cards and I would have been set for the next six games. And I wouldn't have to deal with all the shuffling and unshuffling. And I could still see the variability of the combinations of them. But they're like, we'll give you 50 cards and 70 cards. And between them, you have 3,500 combinations. Yeah. I just don't care. But I love the concept. Bummer. I do want to see it it's done. It's one I was games. interested in. It's definitely one I was interested in. So that's sad to hear that. You're number five. My number five. Or six according to your list. <clears throat> no, it's uh, my list is totally five. Absolutely. It's 100% five. We, my, left two, we left for two hours. You better have time to make it rearranged. We didn't leave for no, two hours. not at all. Through the magic of editing, we would have been here the, the whole time. entire time. time. <laughs> I'm so. Gonna up, I'm going to throw up a single box picture <laughs> in between that cut. Here's your box. Three hours later. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my number five is Acropolis. No. It is. I thought you liked that game. I really, really, really like it. And I am just so... Oh, the cover again. Okay. ...frustrated <laughs> about the cover of that game. Okay. I, like, I would never have picked to play this 
at all. Yeah. If someone hadn't uh, persuaded me yeah. that I would like it. Yeah. And I think that is such a disservice to this game. It is such a good game. It I don't is such a good game. Rob was excellent, amazing game. To the point that you I, did the same thing as me. Yes, I did. You wrote it off. I wrote it off. You wrote it off. And someone said it's like Cascadia, but with levels. And I was like, that that sounds good to me. And I yeah. tried it, and it's Cascadia, but with levels. <laughs> but it's, I, I think the difference to me, and I'm I'm happy as long as you like it. I don't care. And also, by the way, for the record, I traveled here with like three games. Acropolis is one of them. When you mentioned that earlier, I almost was like, oh, that's on my list. And yeah. then and then I knew that you were going to be like, don't tell me. Ahead don't of tell time. me. I like to be surprised. Uh, so I think the difference between this and Soul Fusion, is this called? Soul Forge Fusion. Soul Forge Fusion. I knew there's something, yeah. something, something wrong. Yeah. Soul Forge Fusion. I think the difference between the two of these to me is Acropolis is a game I would never have played until I did. Yeah, yeah, Soul yeah, yeah. Forge is a game I kind of still am hesitant to play knowing that I still have to deal with a prototype yes. feely game. Yes. Acropolis I've gotten over. The components, the tiles themselves actually look nice. Oh, I, they're, they're very satisfyingly thick. Yeah. No, it, Everything about that game works and appeals to me, and I'm I am just frustrated on the part where I feel like they're shooting themselves in the foot. They are with something that doesn't actually translate what the game is. Yes, like the I mean the title is fine, but like that cut it does not communicate at all anything about that game. It not is just like communicates just not generic. It's generic Greek you know, like, yeah. background. And yeah. I'm just like, that game deserves more, like... It deserves better it de art. deserves better art. Second edition. Hashat, second edition game, actually, is I think, Gigamic. It's Gigamic. Gigamic. Yeah. Gigamic. Uh, second edition artwork would be great for that game. You could really sell a lot more copies if the game looked like something people actually wanted to play. Yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, Acropolis is a great game. Play it. And if you were like me, and like Alex, who looked at that cover and was like, that's not a game I need to even look at. Do yourself a favor and play it because so it's, it's worth it. Isn't the game the disappointment is Gigamic? Uh, I wouldn't even say like the publisher overall. I would just say like to me this is so frustrating in the fact that like it is a game that is like hidden behind an unnecessary layer of like meh that you like definitely want it to not be there. I do not disagree one bit. Oh, are you? Are you? I thought you were about to lead into Ghost no, X. No, 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 no. My my number four. Ghost X could have been on this list. I know. Could have been, but it's not. I don't think Ghost X is bad. No, I like Ghost X. Ghost X. You, we we differ on that. Ghost X reminded me both of the reasons why I liked the original Ghost mm -hmm. and why it's not in my collection mm -hmm. anymore. It's also but, not Gigamic. It's sorry, we're not French. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, apology accepted. My number four. <laughs> Is, is it only number four? Is it's, it not it's, lower? It's number four. Wow, my number yeah. four. I'm surprised this is actually so high on the list. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dear goodness. What would be a game that you would say, that I would be saying, I'm surprised it's so high on this list at number four? Mansions of Madness. <laughs> it's not a 2022 title. Twilight Struggle. <laughs> not a Twilight 22 title. It has to be 2022 titles for me. Surprise. A game that you are you surprised. Know I disliked. Oh. Uh huh. Why is my brain not working right now? Give him a second. He'll get there. Or he um, that you actively dislike. I played it once. I will not play it again. You will not play. Oh, now it's like now I really have to know it, but I don't feel like I can get there. With you. With me. Uh. At a convention. At a convention. Oh my goodness. Um. I'm at a loss right at now. At Origins specifically. At Origins specifically. Well, I know it's not Hoplomachus. I know it... Uh, no, it's Gen Con. Yeah. At Origins specifically, and you're like, never again. I mean, I'm not saying never, but I, it would be a lot of convincing. Oh! <laughs> Blood on the Clock Tower. Blood on the Clock Tower is my number four disappointment. And I, to be fair, the reason it is so high on this list... <laughs> Is because I actually don't know if the game is that much of a problem. Yeah. I think the game is okay. I don't think it does what I want out of that genre of game. There's a reason I didn't like games like Werewolf or Mafia or stuff like that. And I think Blood in the Clock Tower kind of continues that trend of a moderator-based experience. I like the non-moderator-based experiences like Resistance Avalon or One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Games like that are more my genre. But the game itself I think is probably fine. But the combination, I think, I think even though it's probably fine... 
it is still this low on this list. It's this high on this list because my experience would have made number one. If you count the experience alone, this would be my number one pick, my most disappointing experience. I mean, I called the video my most disappointing experience or whatever it is, <laughs> and I mean that. But that's the experience. The game itself, I think, is at number four, and that's because I think the game is fine. But I think that I thought it would be better than fine because it was so, and, and many people do think it's better than fine. That's why it's on this list. <laughs> But there's so much hype and buzz about how this is the best hidden role game. This is the best one. This is the be-all and end-all. And this is the one you should play. And I don't know what it did to me. Like, nothing about it compelled it me. I don't know what it did to me. Nothing about it to me felt overly compelling compared to any other hidden role game that does this. And I think the wide breadth of just how much is going on made it overly confusing. And again, my experience was worse. I'll grant that. I played it for the first time in a convention with other games going on in the same room with 20 people and you shouldn't have a 20 person game. Whole bunch of things going on in terms of why it wasn't my ideal experience. But also I played next to somebody as well. I don't even know if I mentioned this in the video. I played next to somebody who was like apparently a professional Blood on the Clock Tower player who was the most sus person I've ever played with. The entire time, everyone around him thought he was like bad, and he was like really good, and he actually was good at the end. When was this? In that Blood and Clock Tower game. Which person? I don't know his name. The one that killed themselves? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Was that actually really good? He was really good. He was the most sus player on the thing, and then everyone around him was like, what, you, you clearly, because you, uh, long story. Either way. I guess it was different perspective, because in that game, I was the demon. Yes, you and were. And so I knew he wasn't yes, good. Yes, you were. And so I, I was... Personally, like, you're terrible at this. Yes, apparently he's played the game quite a bit. Oh. Yeah. I. Either way, not the point. Point is that I was not impressed by Blood on the Clock Tower, but I walked into it thinking, this might be the game that I should love. Mm. And I did not. And so I'm Fair. disappointed at number four. At number four. Now I'm really curious about the remaining three. <laughs> I'm judging it by the game, not the experience. The experience will be number one. Uh, number four for me is uh, Canvas Reflections. And it is not... I, it's it's not actually what the game has done for me. It's what the game has done to the base game for me. I played Canvas Reflections. It was it was so you are actually taught me Canvas, yes. and I had a really good time with it. And I was okay. like, this is quite nice. And then I've played with the expansion a couple times since, and the reversibility of yep. the cards, and the then reflection the of reflection the of the cards. Do you have a Marvel reflection? Dude, I'm Marvel so reflections. excited about that. I, I can't talk about it, though. I signed an NDA. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. That's fair. I, I, I think it's coming out after... Marvel Evolutions. <laughs> Evolvements. <laughs> <laughs> Evolvements. Um, so, for me, I, I, I really like the ability to reverse or reflect the cards and have those layers switch because it definitely breaks up the problem of having several ones in the same section, either right next to each yep. other or that you've already got in your hand. Gives you a lot more flexibility. I like the fact that there are two rows. Yeah, um, that's good. And it just gives you more variety, more versatility, and the optional scoring elements that they introduce in that. Everything about it, I like. And recently I played Base Canvas a couple times, and I was like, I can't play this game without reflections anymore. I was like, I was like, I just, I just much prefer everything that reflections introduced, and it made canvas the base game feel really stifling. Um, and it, it, this is not meant to be I like guess a by that count. My number three is a uh, Tracy <laughs> Crokinole board. Oh, I can't play on any Crokinole board ever now. No, it, it's, Tracy. it's genuinely not meant to be like a bait and switch. It's, it's just like I really had a good time with canvas. And then I played Canvas Reflections, and I was like, oh, this is really, really good. And then I've played Canvas a couple times since, and I was like... I get it. Honestly, I was like, I, I really don't want to play Canvas anymore. If not for the fact that I now own a Tracer Crokinole board, I legitimately <laughs> agree with you yeah. that Tracer Crokinole board is my biggest disappointment of 2022. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. That's fair. My number so, three... Yeah. Oh, wait. No, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just... Yeah. I felt the need to unnecessarily qualify. My number three, and my last three over here, I think, start to fall into the category of... I think so. I think from all the games on this list, the first seven of them for me are games where I do enjoy the experience, mm -hmm. but I have reasons why I was disappointed by the experience. My last three fall into the category of games I would actively prefer not to play again. I think the rest of these were all fine. I just disappointed by them. Mm -hmm. These ones I'd actively prefer not to play. Starting off with number three, which is going to be Block and Key. Mm -hmm. Block and Key from Inside Out Games is one that I... It's a great table piece. It's a great, got a great visual presence. Yeah. The actual gameplay to me felt like grabbing these various tiles and just putting them down on the board in a way you have to perfectly line things up for a visual cue that happens to be tedious in the way that the scoring is executed at the same time. 
So you have this weird diagonal rule that isn't even easy to see. So you have the whole entire game is based on the idea, is that based on the idea that you can see this one level, but then the actual way you place pieces have to like specifically be like, and that's a that, and this one, it's very confusing, it's a little over the top. And the game, they actually have reasons why that happens to exist. That doesn't take away from the fact that it just turns the experience from one thing into a little bit of a complex other thing. And the core gameplay to me just felt very random in the sense that at any point someone can play something. The whole thing just felt random. And the idea of it was very cool. The execution to me was a very nice table piece with no gameplay impact that I cared about. Fair. No, I, it, it definitely, um, I have other ones from uh, Inside, Inside Up, Up games. That, They're that, fantastic. They have great that, games. That I like. I, I think that Block and Key is a really clever production. And I think like the premise of it is really exciting. And I just don't see me coming back to it yeah. enough to justify like I don't see the depth that is going to reflect the ingenuity behind some of the design yeah. choices so I, I I totally can agree with that no, number three for me is kites um, oh, from floodgate yeah so kites oh, kind of like stormed in uh, not <laughs> 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 um, it's kind of like like very abruptly, there was a lot of like chatter about like, oh, kites. It's like you know this this very fast paced, cooperative. You know, you got these sand timers, and I, you know, I have a little bit of real time game experience with like Sorcerer City, which I really enjoy, uh, and then Pendulum, which I liked a lot, but I eventually got rid of because I just didn't see myself playing it much. So, sand timer games, I have like I I've actually play heavier ones like in terms of real time experiences, and this one. It, it's, it's like, interesting. Um, it's rapid-fire timer flipping. Yeah. That's and, all it is. Yeah, and t to me, like, those games are, number one, like, very contingent upon the people that you play with. Like, if you play with someone that is a little bit more, uh, like, paralyzed by real-time games, that can be weird. And then also, I feel like it's it's similar in a way to, like, The Mind, where it feels like... Fantastic game. <clears throat> <laughs> what I'm trying to say... Is, is I feel like just, we got to stop the video. I offended Alex. Um, Go ahead, say more. What I'm what I'm saying is I feel like the core conceit is practicing one skill until you get good at it. Yes. And then beyond that, there's not a ton. I thought kites was a perfectly fun game to play one time, and that's it. Yeah, and that's kind of what it is. But like, I don't want to buy games that I just want to play one or two times. It's a great like, party trip. Yeah, great so, coffee table game. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't disagree. I, I played it. I thought it was fun. I don't think it's a game I need to own. Yeah. My number two is a Kickstarter game I was really looking forward to. Speaking of games like uh, Calico, Cascadia, games like that, this is a point scoring optimization game. So you're going to have all these different animals and different ways that you're trying to score and get points and all these things are going to line up and you know what I'm talking about yet? Endless Winner? What? No. <laughs> you said it. My number two disappointment of 2022 is Endless <laughs> Winner. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> Sorry. You said animals, and I that was like your whole strategy when we no, played in this winter, no. and I was like, uh... Fun fact, I just did my top 22 uh, Kickstarters, crowdfunding games of 2022, and people pointed out, they're like, what about Unconscious Mind? I thought you loved that. I was like, I did. It wasn't on my list. It wasn't Can't on my list. Can't believe you forgot that. It's a shame. Either way, that'll be a different conversation. Back to this one, not in this winter, Wild Serengeti. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have, I have known nothing about this game. Wild Serengeti is an animal game where it's all about moving the animals in order to score cars. The co concept of it sounds intriguing about all this relocation and all that. The problem is the game runs a little long, and also, it, again, it has that thing where it's just, it feels very random. You'll do something that blocks me, similar to actually, similar to um, Block and Key. It has that kind of scoring element where you're trying to achieve a goal, but other players arbitrarily will either help you or hurt you just randomly. Mm. With no good, like, just, okay, great, you move something. Oh, great, that helped me. Oh, wait, now it's your turn, you move something. Well, now it's going to be two turns so I can do that because you got in my way. And the whole thing feels very random in terms of you trying to score a puzzle based on certain things, certain criteria being met, but ultimately it just feels like just chaos and randomness and not very satisfying as an experience. The animal people are delightful. They had another game after... Um, Something, uh, my gosh, can't remember what it's called. Savannah? No. They had another one after. They had not Wild Serengeti. It was Wild Serengeti was renamed to Amazonia. Life of the Amazonia. Yeah, I was, I was about to ask if it's Amazonia. Life of the Amazonia. I think it's called Life of the I Amazonia. I actually was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Life of the Amazonia. I know I'm untrustworthy. <laughs> I, I, that one actually looked more interesting, Life mm. of the Amazonia. But to me, I was already burnt by my experience with Wild Serengeti that I was like, hey, it looks interesting. But then again, so did Wild Serengeti. And so I, I ended up passing that one. Although I'm curious. I'm curious to see what the mm. ratings on that one end up being. It 
it did look interesting. I heard from at least one person who played it that they really enjoyed it. So we'll see. But uh, Wild Serengeti for me, or Life of the Serengeti, I think they renamed it, is uh, my number two disappointment of 2022. Mm. My last two, and I'm just clarifying these before I go into them, okay. are Kickstarters that have not delivered. But when I do an advanced search, you know... That stuff shows up, so I, I BGG cleared me. Okay, you're saying the dates is twenty twenty. Oh, oh, you cheater! Those things do not update all the time. I know. So the the reason why I'm bringing these up is number one, Alex just deals with a much higher volume of games than me. So when when he compiles lists, he has a deep amount of depth to go through, and I just I don't have that in terms of like the amount of stuff I've gone in. But both of these to me are relevant. And n- number nine. <laughs> Gosh darn it. So Number close. two for me is Vampire the Masquerade Chapters. And I say that because... Have you played it? I have. I played it back when the prototype was around. Oh my gosh. I, and it, 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 again, this is like, the, the reason why I'm disappointed is very specific. This is well overdue in terms of fulfillment. Like, this is quite late now. And How late is quite late? I think over a year. I think it's like going to be over eighteen months. Very like by the time the new year starts. I think it was originally slated for July twenty twenty one. You're the one who's right here. I'm just in full on crowdfunding Stockholm syndrome mode. I'm like, if it's been under two and a half years, <laughs> is it even late, bro? <laughs> is it even late? But so the reason why I'm saying this is I am ecstatic about this game. I really want it. Um, I enjoyed the. You know, I was like one of the very early reviewers to cover this. I played um, online on TTS. I had such a fun time with it. And I'm worried because it's taking so long to get here, almost in like a Treadbang Legends kind of vein. Yep. I'm worried that by the time it arrives, my mentality, my mood, like my environment of the games I'm playing, and I, I'm, j- I'm just worried that like, my hype that I have for it and the excitement that I've had and that has currently at least been sustained is like, it's going to land at a time when like I'm playing other games or like maybe I'm interested in something else mechanically. And it's like, it's, it's one that I'm just like desperate to have. And I have been so proud of the Flyos team. Like they're a Canadian uh, publisher that started with some smaller stuff, like until, until daylight. And then they shifted and took this massive world of darkness IP and crafted what looks to be an, has continued to shape up to be a remarkable like narrative campaign ad- in adventure, and I'm just like, I guess when's it gonna get here? This my, my when's list, it gonna get my here? My list last year had a lot of when's things like this. I had Bloodstones on my list last year. Yeah, for the same reason that aspect of I just I just want this to happen right. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm I, I'm I'm just worried that my hype won't hold up hold up by the time it finally does arrive. So that that's yes. my number two. My number one is. A true disservice to a different game because they took a game also as we get to two and one please recognize that he ranked and I didn't so like the level of attachment and emotion we have is very different Devin's like here are the games I'm disappointed by here's the game where I didn't like the artist here's the game where I had a bad bathroom day that day like just moving down the list and so those those are his like most disappointed Guys, games I'm disappointed okay but the, the the contrast is you as your list gets to the end you're coming with the things you have to search harder for <laughs> And those are your worst picks. Vampire the Masquerade is my second most disappointing game of 2022 because I can't wait for it to be here. <laughs> it's one. valid disappointment. The it is, disappointment it's, it, it's is just valid. the order. The order is funny. Yeah. My number one, and this is the game I am most disappointed by from all the games I play, primarily because they took a game, then they named it after that game, and called it a two-player version of that game, and they have nothing to do with each other in any way, shape, or form. And the two-player version is a meh game at best versus the other original version is a very solid game. But not only is it just, like, you know, not as good, it's not remotely the same. It does the original game a huge disservice. Anyone who plays the follow-up version is going to play the original, is, is not, never going to play the original. Cryptid Urban Legends. Oh, I could not do that puzzling out in my Cryptid brain. Cryptid Urban Legends is a two-player version of Cryptid. Same publisher. Cryptid's a great deduction game. Cryptid Urban Legends is... Why didn't they do, like, Cryptid Duel? They could have called it. That wouldn't have been, <laughs> it would have been bad. It would have been bad. It doesn't matter. The point is they called it based on the original and said it's a two-player version of it when it has nothing to do with each other. 
Mm. Like, you know, seven one is seven one is dual. Do those feel like very reminiscent of being in the same universe at least? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's how you do it. Oh, oh, you're saying it's not even that. It's not even remotely. It's like, here's this game, which is going to be a deduction puzzle of how you have to try to figure out based on questions and answers and all these things of like where the cryptids are. Very solid, excellent game. Hmm. And then here's a little tactical abstract game that like feels like one of the least inspired abstract games I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Nothing to do with each other. And that they would, named it. Upsetting. So not only was the game not great, and it was not great. It wasn't the worst game I've ever played, but it was certainly not great. But they named it after a different game to the point that those who liked the original game are going to walk into this thinking they're getting something like that and be disappointed. And those that play the second game are never going to try the first game. Or even if they do, maybe they like the second game. Maybe they like little tactical abstracts. Then look at the other game, and it's totally different. So, yeah. That's the, the most frustration I have towards any game on this list. And I was like, your fr- your emo- your emotive expression, like you got you got yeah. up, you got worked up. Yeah. You got up there. Yeah. Compared you to okay? Marvel Urban Legends, which is great. Marvel Urban, Le- I cannot wait for that to come out. Yeah. Right after Evolvements and Revolution. Re- Re- Reflections. Re- <laughs> you realize that this is going to this is the thing now. This is an additional inside joke. It's just Marvel plus now. Well, the next one is Marvel Refrigerables. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, at what point do you think people stop watching when it's Long ago. literally just nonstop inside jokes? Okay, my number one, which again is not ranked, <laughs> and I do not have the venom in my voice that Alex This is his did. most disappointing experience of 2022. Is Draft and Write Records. From Inside Up? Yeah. I love that one. I did. I am Wait, so frustrated that this did not get any amount of like, like I really wish that this campaign did better. Like it's a it, hard sell. It, 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 it is. So like thematically or so like on the- So when I said block and key, you're like, okay, we're about to give Inside Up crap for two very different reasons. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, it's just not as fault. Like I was actually, I've talked about this with Connor a couple times. Like I- I, I am more frustrated about how that campaign didn't do yep. than I have been about a lot of campaigns. Like I expected I, it. I, no, so it's like... But it's music. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, like the gameplay is so it's clever. Amazing. It's really, really, really good. And I know that you had a different experience than me. No, you I played, loved it. No, but no, you played the physical copy. Yes. So I don't know how that was. I played TTS, which was scripted, which was beautiful. It moves so quickly. And it does all of the card layout for you, so it's a little bit easier than dealing with a prototype. I played both TTS and physical, mm. and I want to say, I, I agree this TTS was scripted nicely, but I also prefer physical. You prefer the physical. And so yeah. I think overall, I, I think both were very good. But like, it, it did just over 60,000 Canadian, and I just like, I think, I truly think Draft and Write Records is one of Inside Up Games' best titles. It's probably my favorite of theirs. I haven't played Earth. Well, I've only played... Um, actually, no, I've played Earth too. I forgot about So, that. yeah. I, have, I haven't played Earth, and I've only played Summit like once, but I, I think Draft and Write Records is a very clever design, and it's definitely one of those games where, like, it can be played casually and people can have a good time with it, but when uh, me and the uh, my friend George from Oniro, like, the two of us played with Connor, and Connor, we got to the scoring, and I was like, uh, I was like... 132 or something like that and George was like 134 and we were like hey nice we're close and Connor's like 235 and we were like oh there are levels to this game and we did not unlock the boss level you want levels to this game so this is where I get to brag oh what did you score I hate you already already I hate you oh I scored like 60 and then he scored less what so this is you want to talk levels levels did you guys hate no. Do everything. I rushed the end game. I did everything I could to rush the end game with a low score to outpace his score. How mad was he? He, he was, I think he liked it. He was like, <laughs> he's like, that's because you talk about levels. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, an additional yeah. way to play the game. I haven't seen that before, yeah. It was just a two player director. It was definitely hate drafting. There was two player. One of the nice things is this game also, a two player works very well with hate drafting. Larger player accounts, you want to focus on building your engine. Yeah. But there was, I can't remember what I did, but there's a way to. I think I just rushed certain bonuses or something like that. And I just quickly, I, I ignored everything. I ended up taking like all the negative points you could possibly take for not filling in your band. I got mm. like all of those, but I rushed the bonus cards. So, oh, you got the you got the crew penalty. Yes, yeah. and gotcha. I just got I, I told, fully load up. I was like I was like I don't care. I'm gonna rush this end game and see what I can do. Yeah. It was the lower score I got while playing the game, but it was higher than his because I knew what was happening. That's so interesting. Yes. That's clever. Yeah. So I mean, like, 
I don't know if late pledge is still available or anything, but just like genuinely, if you have not checked out Draft and Write Records, I understand that like the theme or the idea of it might seem like obtuse to most people. It's not like the most uh, approachable theme in terms of what a lot of us expect from like fantasy or sci-fi or whatever. Musical games historically yeah. in the board game space have not done amazing. Do yourself a favor and try that game out. It is such a good game. It's very. It solid. is such a good game. I man, I, our, yeah. Our, our number one picks, like <laughs> Alex. This game's a disservice to games everywhere. Devin's like back my most disappointed game ever. <laughs> Find the late pledge. You won't regret it. I'm so disappointed. You you know what I'm ready for though is the like 15 comments that are gonna be like. Devin does not understand that there is an agreed upon structure for Alex's lists and you do not follow them and it drives me crazy. But wouldn't it be ironic if the people who are watching this video were disappointed by it? (laughs) And with that... The number one disappointment of 2022 is people watching Devin's list of disappointments from 2022. We got got more lists this time. (laughs) In any case, until next time, those are our arguably most disappointing games or experiences or something about them of 2022. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I'm Devin Talks Board Game Co. And have a good one. See ya.